The transistor is essentially an electrically driven switch that allows or denies the passage of a current between two terminals. So these two points, in this case, would be something like this. It would be two contacts that we call source and drain. Source and drain. And they're made yeah. of? They're made out of silicon, but modified to turn it into essentially a metallic material. So what you do in here, you just add a very high concentration of impurities, such as phosphorus, that have extra electrons. This basically has the consequence of giving many more electrons available. And when the concentration is high enough, there is so many that the silicon effectively becomes like a metal. And then, so these are like the two ends of the switch that can be opened or closed, right? And so the next thing you want is the switch. So the switching action, so you will have, let's say, some electrical contacts here. And then you want something that controls the switch. So something that acts like, you know, your hand, <laughs> your <laughs> finger pushing the switch when you turn the light on or off. So this is done by adding an extra electrode. This one will be made of metal or, again, of very highly conductive silicon, which is on top of this insulator. And this is called the gate. Now, if you do nothing, these two highly metallic silicon electrodes with the semiconducting silicon in between will not conduct any current. It's like a switch that's open. Okay? There is no channel for the current to pass in here. If instead you apply a very positive voltage on here, so let's say you have a battery of about, let's say, 2 volts, what this will do, you see, the positive is here, right? So you have a positive potential. What that will do is it will attract electrons underneath, right? You have a, a metal with a positive potential on it. Electrons are negative charges, so they're attracted by the positive potential. So electrons will start to accumulate under this insulating layer of, let's say, silicon oxide. And when they do so, at some point, they form a conductive channel that connects the source and drain. So now you have closed the switch. Okay? So you've gone from an open switch, lights off, to a closed switch, lights on. But without any mechanically moving part, all you've done is to change the voltage on this electrode here. Right? In the old days, people made structures like this with feature sizes of order of microns. Now, what people call the size of a transistor is this distance here, is the distance between the source and the drain. So this is the minimum space you need, plus some space for these contacts to fit a transistor somewhere. So it is the most handy measure of how much space on a chip a transistor will take, which tells you, given a chip of this size, how many transistors you can put on. So in the old days, people started making these things of size, you know, several microns, even you know, fractions of a millimeter. Essentially, Moore's law tells you that this size, well, Moore's law, there's, there's different incarnations of it. I think the most famous one is that the number of transistors per chip uh, doubles every 18 months, which means that the size needs to shrink accordingly to fit more transistors on the chip. And so that being an exponential law, it means that the size of the transistors must shrink exponentially. So if you make a plot of the size versus year, now we should look it up on a proper table, but I'm kind of inventing here. So let's say 19, let's start from the 70s, 80, 90, 2000, 2010. Um, well, this would be actually log of size. <laughs> so you will have a line that looks like this. And so we are now, 2013, we are now at a 22 nanometer node, which means this distance between the source and the drain of this transistor is 22 nanometers. Now, the thing to realize is that 22 nanometers means there's about 50 silicon atoms in here between source and drain. 
So we are really reaching the atomic size, but not in some exotic laboratory device. In every device you have in your computer and your mobile phone. How many transistors are on a chip now? About a billion, depending on what you buy. You like so a, a normal quad-core, let's say, on a, on a good computer with a quad-core processor, there's between one and two billion transistors. Why is that so important, the number of transistors? Well, because that essentially is what gives you the computing power. That is what determines how many operations in parallel your computer can do. So that determines how big you know, a video your iPhone is able to play. That determines how complicated a calculation uh, your computer can do to, you know, to either do proper calculations of things or to show you know, images or to process words or any other thing you do with your computer. Can the size of this go on forever? Can that keep dropping? Well, so essentially the, what determines whether the transistor works or not is whether you can stop the electrons effectively enough when these two electrodes come so close to each other. Okay? So essentially you have two electrodes, the two ends of the switch, that are coming closer and closer and closer and closer, and you're still trying to find a way to block the current in between them. At some point, quantum mechanics becomes a problem. So in quantum mechanics, we know that even if there is a potential barrier between two electrodes, electrons can still flow because of a quantum mechanical effect called the quantum tunneling. Essentially, electrons can go through the wall, as it were. But the probability of them doing so depends on how high that barrier is. So the whole art of making this ultra small transition transistors is essentially the problem of uh, engineering a potential barrier that is high enough despite being so thin that it manages to stop the current by probably 2025 you would get to the level where you literally have like just three or four atoms in here and at that point, it becomes really hard to imagine that you can keep quantum mechanics out of the way. So in a sense, the whole challenge for modern microelectronics, or I should call it nanoelectronics, to keep pursuing Moore's law and keep having transistors that function just like the light switches you have in your room, is to avoid quantum mechanics to start playing a role. Because quantum mechanics would allow the current to pass even though you're trying to stop it. So that is really the engineering problem. Trying to keep quantum mechanics out of this. That's right. But your research is actually trying to put quantum mechanics into. Yes. And what we are trying to do is, in fact, not something that is um, a different way to pursue Moore's law. We are trying to build a completely different machine that is not you know, along the path of evolution of the current computers. It's just a completely different computational machine that actually uses the laws of quantum mechanics to give you an exponentially greater computing power even though you actually can have just a small number of bits or quantum bits as we call them. Call them qubits? Call them qubits. Then you have like 2 to the 300 classical bits which is as many particles as there are in the universe. 